This video is dedicated to an especially dedicated fan, who's been essentially spamming almost every video I make to make a video on Seats. At first I was annoyed, then I started ignoring it. However, I felt like since I was going to get to it eventually, I might as well get it over with. So, I hope that fan enjoys this. Don't say I never give y'all what you want. It was unnerving to drink among the tree trunk legs, like having a clump of forest drift around you. Shadows would swing across the ground as the herbivores bent their necks to drink, sometimes falling over the allosaur, who went tense during the little eclipse. Sunlight bounced off the pool and oscillated on the dinosaur's undersides, so that both light and shade moved at the watering hole. A flock of small white pterosaurs streamed between the sauropods' necks, their wings whispered as they beat against the morning air. They would not settle in the midst of the wandering herd. They lacked the bravado or stupidity to try to navigate the sauropods' mashing footsteps. Siats was neither daring nor stupid, just thirsty. But within the grove of strolling sauropods, the allosaur spent more time nervously watching the trajectories of crushing feet than drinking. As little as we know of the vast history of life on Earth, what we do know is quite a story. There are plenty of gaps in our knowledge. Certain groups have never left a single trace of their existence. While some leave plenty, then all of a sudden disappear from the fossil record only to reoccur alive and well in today's world. Unfortunately for us, there's a large gap in time between Allosaurs of the Late Jurassic and Tyrannosaurs of the Late Cretaceous. This evolutionary and ecological top predator gap was filled in a little with the discovery of the early Cretaceous Acrocanthosaurus, which you can learn about in my two-part series here. This large hump-spined theropod was a Carcharodontosaur, which are a group of extremely large theropods that diverged from allosaurs during the late Jurassic epoch. In the early Cretaceous, Carcharodontosaurs spread over much of the globe with Giganotosaurus, Tyrannotitan, and Mapusaurus from South America, Carcharodontosaurus from Africa, and Shao Qilong from Asia, as main examples. How did the balance of power shift from slender-skulled Carcharodontosaurs to bone-busting Tyrannosaurs? Luckily for our understanding of the story, there exists another example of these kinds of theropods which sheds a little more light on the transition between these two classes of powerful predators. Between the dig season of 2008 and 2010, fossils were uncovered from the Muss and Touch it member of the Cedar Mountain Formation of Utah. These fossils were very fragmentary, and together represent a member of the Allosauroid clade. They were described and given the name Siats Meeker Orum in 2013 by Dr. Lindsay Zano and Dr. Peter Makovicki, both of which played a hand in its discovery and excavation. It was named after a mythological monster of the indigenous Ute people of Utah and Colorado. Altogether, what was found included back vertebrae, pelvic vertebrae, and tail vertebrae, pieces of the pelvis, a chunk of lower leg, and a few toe bones. Not a lot to go off of, so I'll try my best. The bones belonging to this single Siats individual provide clues suggesting it wasn't fully grown. The neural arches of the vertebrae aren't completely fused to the central disc, which means it had yet to reach skeletal maturity. Dr. Zano and Dr. Makovicki used measurements of Megaraptor and theropods to estimate a length for this individual, which came out as 11.9 meters or 39 feet long. This makes it one of the largest theropods known from North America. At full adult size, Seats may have rivaled Acrocanthosaurus. This young individual also had a mass estimation done by measuring the circumference of the leg bone and using a mathematical formula called a femur circumference regression, which belched out an estimate of four tons. Though the fossils are only bits and pieces, it is possible to get a generalized reconstruction of what this animal may have looked like based on its close relatives. This is where another problem arises. Dr. Zano and Dr. Makovicki recovered Siats as a member of the Allosauria. This group is easily recognizable to many as carnivorous theropods with thin triangular skulls 
and arms capped in long, talon-like claws. This group largely went extinct by the end of the late Jurassic, but not without producing new variants better adapted to the changing environment. Carcharodontosauria diverged from the Allosaurians and split into two groups, the Carcharodontosauridae and the Neovenatoridae. The Carcharodontosaurids took the anatomy of the Allosaurians and tweaked it to great effect. These guys were much larger on average than the earlier Allosaurians, with bulkier heads and shorter arms. Examples include the charismatic Giganotosaurus of South America and Carcharodontosaurus of Africa. They thrived during the early Cretaceous and eventually declined by the end of the Cretaceous, their last strongholds being South America and Africa. The Neovenatorids were more like their ancient Allosaurian ancestors, with a few tweaks. They primarily remained smaller in size than the gigantic Carcharodontosaurids. Their skulls looked like a cross between Jurassic Allosaurs and Cretaceous Carcharodontosaurs, with a heavily rounded backside to the lower jaw, a teardrop shaped skull, rougher and more reduced lacrimal eye crests, and large numbers of holes pockmarking the snout. Siats happens to be missing pretty much every single piece of the head, minus some dubious teeth here and there. It's also missing the arms and most of the legs. This makes it difficult to place it in either Carcharodontosauridae or Neovenatoridae, or even another group altogether. Dr. Zano and Dr. Megavicki's analysis on Siats found it firmly rooted in the Allosauria and the Carcharodontosauria. More specific classifications are a tad blurry. Based on different characteristics of the bones and different ways of tallying characteristics of other Allosaurs, Siats could belong to the Neovenatoridae or the Megaraptora. Megaraptorans have had a long, drawn-out, mysterious history. They're largely fragmentary, with examples nearly worldwide. They remain difficult to classify, as some analyses have found them as a special type of Allosaurian, while others found them as a very weird offshoot of the Tyrannosauroidea clade. How we speculatively reconstruct Siats depends on how we classify it. If it belongs to the Megaraptora, it may have had much larger forearms and claws, as well as a shallower skull. In this case, Siats would likely be one of the larger Megaraptorans, and quite a deadly predator. If it was a Neovenatorid, Siats would have had comparatively smaller arms and claws, and a more teardrop-shaped skull. The environment of Siats is less blurry. Siats remains were uncovered from the Mus and Touchet member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The Mus and Touchet is a small layer at the very top of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The Cedar Mountain Formation is an even bigger layer of rock, which dates to the early Cretaceous epoch, and is generally separated from the underlying Morrison Formation due to its age and similarity among the different, smaller layers within it. At the very top, within the Mus and Touchet layer, lay the bones of many other dinosaurs, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. With Siats, as the large body top predator, there apparently wasn't room for the expansion of other groups of theropods into the same size range. The teeny tiny, ancient tyrannosauroid, Moros, was scrounging for small mammals, reptiles, and dinosaurs alongside the Allosaurian top dog. I can imagine a scenario in which the larger Siats has taken down a large Hadrosaur, and a pair of Moros look on in anticipation of what they might receive once the Allosaur grows bored of its meal. Tyrannosauroids were much smaller at this time and did not occupy the top rungs of the ecosystem. Cedarpelta was an armored tank which used its relatively pointed snout to choose specific types of plants to grind between its leaf-shaped teeth. As an opposite to this style of feeding, the much larger Peloroplites had a wide muzzle for taking large bites of many different types of plants at once. A bit closer to the menu of Siats were the early hadrosaurs, like Eolambia, devoid of novel bits and bobs, or the long-tailed raptor punching bag, Tenontosaurus. Much faster than Siats were the bulldog-sized bipedal Zephyrosaurus, a better contender for the menu of Dromaeosaurs. Speaking of Dromaeosaurs, the world-renowned Deinonychus is found here. Maybe it tussled with Tenontosaurus every now and then? Abetosaurus were the largest animals of this ecosystem, a titanic brachiosaur that could stretch its neck up into the canopies of conifers, which dotted the landscape. The bones of Siats worked to help solve a little bit of a problem. 
before Siats, there was only a single taxon of giant allosauroid known from the first 70 million years of Cretaceous-aged North American strata, Acrocanthosaurus. Unfortunately, no early Tyrannosauroid fossils have been found in the same time and place as Acrocanthosaurus. No other allosauroid fossils were found after, and advanced Tyrannosaur fossils pop up around 80 to 70 million years ago till the end of the Cretaceous at 66 million years. These sampling biases have led to the hypothesis that predator assemblages in this interval were low in diversity and relatively consistent in amount of species throughout North America. This hypothesis also states this lack of biodiversity and continental homogeneity covered up the rise of tyrannosaurs to the top predator niche. This may be why we don't see as many early tyrannosauroids during the early and mid Cretaceous. Occurrence of siats and early tyrannosauroid fossils like Moros in the same rock unit offers a direct test to the hypothesis that the big allosauroids were the competitive reason why tyrannosauroids didn't reach record sizes until the late Cretaceous when allosauroids went extinct. This can be extrapolated to at least some of Laurasia, as large-bodied allosauroids and diminutive tyrannosauroids are found in overlapping time and place in Europe and Asia. However, this is yet to be proven for Gondwana. There's an exception in Australia, as there are some fragmentary tyrannosauroid fossils overlapping in time and place with allosauroid fossils. These remains are more fragmentary than those found in the assemblages of Siats, and therefore are more of an outlier for Gondwana rather than a rule. Even if these are just an outlier, more corroborating evidence of allosaur and tyrannosauroid fossils in the same time and place are forthcoming, and may prove to be a global or near-global occurrence from the start of the Cretaceous to its end. This giant before the tyrants provides a data point for paleontologists to better understand the ecology and evolution of North American dinosaurs and how Tyrannosaurus became the tyrant lizard we know it as. Had it not been for creatures like Siats and Acrocanthosaurus, early Tyrannosaurs may have ballooned to the sizes we're familiar with millions of years earlier. That'll wrap it up for this monstrous nightmare. What do you think about this predator gap? What might have filled it? Comment below and let me know. Subscribe if you liked what you see and you want to see more. Outcompete the bell icon as well, just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Next level.